Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about uh, my experience teaching uh, remotely, and um, I'll contrast that with my experience teaching face-to-face uh, -face, uh, in the classroom. And um, uh, I'm only going to talk about undergraduate and postgraduate because I really don't have any experience at all with K-1 through 12. So my background, um, I taught uh, in the classroom for University of Maryland. Um, I was teaching uh, airmen in the Air Force who had signed up to study for their baccalaureate while they were in the service. Um, in a 1981 past 1990, I was an adjunct professor of computer science and I taught both undergraduate and graduate courses in computer science. Remote learning, uh, 2013 to present. I've been teaching uh, at the Georgia Institute of Technology and I've been teaching in their uh, professional masters in systems engineering course. And they call it a professional masters because it's a little like an MBA, it's considered a terminal degree. So I have background both in teaching uh, locally and teaching remotely. Um, the first thing I want to do is I want to contrast remote and online. Um, sometimes people will use the terms interchangeably, um, but they're really quite different. Um, if you're remote, you are remote. You can't walk into the campus labs. You can't walk into the bookstore. You have no physical access to the library. Um, all study groups are online in uh, Microsoft Teams breakout rooms or something like that. You can't walk into the teacher's office and ask a question. Um, if uh, I used to teach and students would come up to me at the end of the class and ask questions, there's none of that, um, although you can do you can do face to face with uh, a webinar. Uh, look at the talking heads. Um, many of the students who are local to a school, uh, like Rutgers or Stevens, will take online courses. So you have to distinguish between online and remote, because remote means there's a wall between you and the college campus and you can't go near it. Not necessarily because you're, free, you're not allowed, but simply because of the fact that you're usually in another state, sometimes even in another country. So first I want to talk about uh, non-pedagogical pedagogical issues associated with uh, teaching and the problems that they cause. Um, on campus, there's the issue of students typically having to do part-time work. Uh, my son was uh, in a room where his uh, roommate had a jug of vodka under the bed and he didn't make it through four years. My son did, but the other guy didn't. Uh, there's no parental guidance of any kind. Um, people are inexperienced, first time, away, uh, first time uh, away from home on a college campus in a dormitory. Uh, I have another son who had, uh, had trouble with his roommates. It can get lonely at holiday times. And of course, um, there's the issue of disabilities. Remote, um, we have <laughs> distraction caused by family and friends. Um, it's a little different than what you have on campus because on campus you can't have your mom walk up to you and say, clean your room. Um, there's lack of quality IT equipment. Um, people very often have difficulty with the IT equipment. They're struggling with it. If you have to take a course, very often you, you have to mail order the books and sometimes it's very hard to come by the books. You can't just walk into a bookstore and get them. Um, lack of maturity, which causes problems, time budgeting. Um, when you're off campus, it can seem like you're isolated and you can have difficulty getting mentoring. There's no one to walk into your room, sit down with you and go through material. Um, accessing teachers can be difficult. I know that when you're, when you're remote, um, the teachers just don't give you, uh, the faculty don't give you the time 
that they would give you uh, if you were uh, on campus. Uh, you could walk into a room on campus and there might be two or three students there talking to a teacher and you could join the conversation. Uh, it's very difficult to do things like that remotely. Um, and then there are, of course, the psychological problems. Uh, throw um, throw the, uh, the coronavirus into the mix and it makes for a mess. Okay, I just give you an anecdotal incident uh, to talking about motivation. Um, I was a second lieutenant in McClellan Air Force Base and studying for a PhD in mathematics. So I had to take uh, uh, some makeup courses to bring me up to level so I could go on. And I had to take things like advanced partial differential equations. And three of 20 students in the course achieved an A, myself, and two retired Sacramento civil servants. So uh, very often you can't just talk about remote versus local. You have to talk about undergraduate versus graduate learning because graduate learning, the motivation is always there. Undergraduate, not so much. So you think about the factors. You have a prior achievement, uh, the complexity of the material, uh, student maturity, and of course, motivation. Sometimes motivation can overcome problems with uh, complexity of the ma material. Sometimes it can't. And then we also have the issue of full versus part-time. So full-time students tend to be younger than part-time students just because do the math. Full-time students are trying to get through it in four years. Part-time students take longer because they can take fewer credits a semester. So maturity helps, especially when you're remote. Um, Part-time students are typically working and going to school at the same time. And you have all kinds of issues associated with that. But remote is it's like throwing a monkey wrench in, into the mix. Here's a, another issue. I have a friend, uh, Dan Berry, who's deaf, legally deaf, and he, he's a pro and he reads lips. So he can't take phone calls. And the minute he can read lips so that he can have office hours, he can convert face to face with a student and understand what they're saying. Um, and I tried to send him a lecture I had given to look at. He couldn't look at it because uh, he was looking at a lecture with no sound, virtually. And he says if there's no if there's no lips he can read, and if the bandwidth is inadequate, it's not good enough. He needs a high refresh rate. So you know that's another problem is uh, uh, dealing with children who have disabilities, uh, especially on a remote level. Local is bad enough, but remote makes it a lot worse. Okay, so the, basically the university quad chart looks something like this. You have traditional undergraduate, and you can do just about everything except for labs, which is another problem, because if you want to be an engineering major uh, or a chemistry or a physics major, you got problems. Graduate, uh, traditional, same story you have. In addition to that, um, you need to do research, and very often there's equipment involved. I remember when I was doing my graduate work, I had to use specialized um, equipment in the, uh, in the laboratory. And you can't do that uh, uh, if you're remote. Face-to-face, um, -face, uh, that's nice when you can get it. And then, of course, the labs. Remote, again, the issue is no labs. And uh, research, you have to do it remotely. Um, it's so nice to be able to walk into a library, walk up to the desk, and talk to the uh, librarian. It's doable remotely, and I've done it, but it's much more difficult. OK, so the limitations of remote learning that I observed, um, some of which are uh, chemistry, physics, electronics, and so on, you're not going anywhere, basically. You, you, can, you, you need hands-on. You can only go so far without hands-on experience. Um, another problem is the internet. Um, you have low-income students going to college, 
And when you tell them uh, you're going to have to work remotely, many of them cannot afford good Wi-Fi. They don't have good Wi-Fi at home. Um, they have difficulty with the course material. And, you know, many people think, oh, it's not a problem. We'll just do it remotely. But they forget about all the people who have poor quality Wi-Fi at home. And uh, maybe the solution to something like that is to, ha to treat Wi-Fi as a utility and make it available to everybody in the country and just put it into the taxes. That would be my preference, and um, it would certainly uh, certainly help the uh, lower income uh, kids who are having who are struggling with uh, without a laptop and without Wi-Fi. Okay, um, so legally, um, everything is in place to make Wi-Fi a utility. Uh, the laws are in place, and it's just lobbying by the. Uh, by the carriers that's preventing it from happening. And we have, uh, I won't talk about the government, but government and the politicians, the current Democrats, Republicans, whatever, they're very susceptible to lobbying and to money for their campaigns. Okay, another question is, how do you proctor remote examinations? Um, it can be expensive. I remember that um, when I was at the Educational Testing Service, they were using Sylvan Learning Centers. Um, and it's no guarantee that of prevention of cheating. Um, I remember at the Educational Testing Service, my uh, friend ran across 100 people who'd taken the SAT exam. And strangely enough, they all had the same photograph. So uh, that can happen. Okay. Another good uh, location for proctoring is the public library. Uh, my wife, who's a librarian, pointed out to me that the libraries do an excellent job, at least the ones in the local area, in providing proctoring services. However, if that were to be universal, they might get swapped uh, with requests. If you have, think of all the colleges just in the state of New Jersey, and if they all required uh, proctoring, uh, the, the libraries would basically be overloaded. Um, so my experience, uh, I'm going to change hats a little bit now and talk about my experience teaching locally. Um, so I taught both undergraduate and graduate courses in computer science. And when I walked into a classroom and I stood in front of the students, I had usually had between 23 and 50 students in a class, I could tell if there was a problem. You could see students with a puzzled look on their face. And another problem was that students were embarrassed to ask questions. They knew the material, they, were, they, they had a problem, but they were afraid or embarrassed to ask questions. You especially get that with the lower ranks, you know. And I could easily tell if I was losing the students. And so what I could do then is I could call on somebody and say, um, are you having a problem? Would you like me to go over it again? I would couch it in terms that would not embarrass them. And it was much easier to do that. And then I could gradually bring the whole class along. Um, it's also easier to talk to students after class than in office hours. Um, because what happens is you're standing there, the students are leaving the room, and they can walk up to you and start asking questions. And uh, the office hours, very often, some of them worked, and some of them had other classes, they had other obligations, and very often it was difficult to get students to come in for office hours. Um, the other thing is it was easier for students to just look at the person sitting next to them and say, hey, would you like to study with me? That worked too, and it's much harder to do that um, when all you can see is a talking head. Um, and the other thing I found is that if a student had a problem on an exam, I could bring them into my office and sit down with them, and I could walk through the exam line by line and help them so they'd be ready for the next exam. And I found it's very difficult to express empathy through a computer monitor. It really is. So um, I don't care about remote. I think, uh, well, you, you can, you're pretty much getting to uh, see what my personal feeling is about remote. Okay, I, I had a, a unique experience, and this will give you another example of remote versus local. 
Uh, this was a course on compiler theory, and I had several uh, Chinese students in the class. They never asked questions, never, ever asked me questions. Did okay in the exams, but never asked questions. So what they would do is they would, I found out from one of the students afterwards who did speak English, they would all get together after class. Uh, they would pool the questions, give them to the one volunteer who spoke a good English, and then the next class, he would have a list of questions and he'd read them off to me. You can't do that with remote. It doesn't work. And the, one, of the, one of the students, Chinese students, could be, in this case, they were Chinese, but it could be any language. In this case, one was, in, one, one, one was uh, you could have one in uh, California, one in New York. So that, that technique only works for local. It doesn't work for remote. So discussion boards help. I'm sure you've all seen them. Uh, whenever you do remote, you have what's called a discussion board. And that's where students can post a question. And serially, other students can answer the question and the instructor can answer the question. There's only one problem. It doesn't get used enough. And the reason it doesn't get used enough is because students, especially at the graduate level, can be embarrassed and they are embarrassed to ask questions. I'm a graduate student and why am I asking a question that could be very simple? So um, we tried to tell them to use the discussion boards. If they can't, they can email me a question or email the instructors a question, but that's problematic because you have well over 30 students in the class and you can't handle uh, 30, 30 to 50 questions a night. That doesn't work. And when you answer a question in the discussion board, you're answering it for all the other students too. So um, it, it's much better. Um, uh, anyway, I'm not going to go into that. It's political. Anyway, here's an example of a discussion board. Um, discussion board allows you to go in, into great detail in answering a question. You can attach things and so on. And you can ask detailed questions. The nice thing about it is the, the whole class all of the students in the class can see the answer. And usually it's pushed to their emails so they're alerted that there's an answer to a question. So that's very useful. It's one of the positive things. And I think they should have the discussion boards even for local teaching. Um, I, I imagine now they probably do. They're wonderful. OK, multiple choice test. That's another one. Um, People want to do multiple choice tests. Now, why am I bringing up multiple choice tests, which can be done either locally or remotely? The answer is very simple. The answer is you can put a multiple choice test online and automate the test and automate the grading, which means that it is, it is so much easier for an instructor remotely to handle a lot of students. Personally, uh, multiple choice tests don't, I think they don't give you the depth they need, but they're a good uh, way to jog the students into reading the book. Um, so um, I'm not going to go into the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, I understand Dennis is going to post the uh, lecture and you can you look at that yourself. So uh, one of the things about multiple choice is that you can build up a pool of questions and then you can randomize the pool so that no two students get the same set of questions, which is very nice. Okay, again, it's easier to grade in class with a large number of students. Um, the grading can be automated. Um, you can randomly assemble a quiz. Immediate feedback of the correct answer is available. A student sees the correct answer and whether they got it right. And here's the one that I don't like. The one that I don't like is I've, I developed 10 multiple choice tests for Georgia Tech. And they can use those tests over and over and over and I don't get nothing. Same for my lectures. I've recorded now 20 or 30 lectures in the various classes. They play them over and over and over, and I get absolutely nothing for it. Well, that's just me anyway. And I'm afraid, I'm really scared that that's the future of uh, universities. Anyway, here's a sample quiz. Value engineering is used to, and the answer is B, um, and it's right out of the textbook. And they have a textbook, and they can look up the answers. We, we did these questions not to fool them or to find out who's good, but we wanted them to read the book. 
So we came up with a set of questions that every question, you can go to the index of the book uh, and look it up and find the answer. And uh, believe it or not, some students still get it wrong. All they had to do was open up the book and look and they could have found the answer to every question. And we wanted them to read the book. Okay, anyway, um, pure remote teaching, the students do not meet personally. Um, I cannot see their body language in a lecture and very often a lot of them don't show up. It's much easier to see in a, a class physically who's there than in a lecture when you have 30 heads and you can't tell if one of them's missing. Um, again, the schools fall back on pre-recorded lectures. They reuse them every year and they don't pay royalties. Um, office hours, which I do, are crowded. Um, I have, uh, like for example, I have uh, Wednesday, I have 4.30 to 6, and it's blocked out five students per session. And then we have two other instructors who also do the same thing at the same time. Um, you know, the homeworks are all due Monday morning. The labs are due Monday morning. And it's not good when I get 50 emails on a Saturday night or a Sunday night at midnight and the lab is due at six o'clock on Monday morning. It doesn't help me. It doesn't help my karma anyway. Okay, one of the things that we started to use uh, is online breakout rooms. Now, I'm going to talk about the difference between on-site, face-to-face, and online, but uh, remote. But first, just let me tell you what it is physically. It's a set of rooms where students can go to the room, they can meet, and you can have students uh, uh, for different subjects getting together, and they can see each other just as we can now. But instead of the entire class of 30 or 40 students, you only have the students on, interested in a specific topic. And you can see on the left layer there where some of the teams are, uh, usually it's five to six students per teams. They say unique names like SMASH and SEMS and BOSS. Anyway, those are the teams. Okay, so uh, I want to compare online and remote because this, this will give you an inkling into the problems that we're having. Um, um, so uh, the intro to systems engineering is one week, and I want to talk about that one week, which is on site. This year it was physically, they get together and they do an analysis of a case study. And I'll walk through the hotel lobby and I'll see a bunch of them and I'll go over and help them. They might have a question or something. And then each student presents a project in five minutes during the course of, uh, I think that's Tuesday, 30 students in a class. And then the students and faculty vote, six to eight projects are selected. And then you take those projects and they're on flip charts. And students walk up to the flip charts and they put their name down if they wanna be on that project. Um, and then students have time to get together with their teammates, they can meet for dinner, they can discuss what they want to do and then they can go to somebody's hotel room or they can go to a Georgia Tech meeting room afterwards and uh, plan, plan what they want to do for the rest of the week. Um, during the remaining time in the week, they meet with their teammates in the evenings and during breakout sessions with dinner and the instructors like myself walk around, meet with all the teams and help them where they have questions. So here's a sample student proposal. This is a controlled network personal electronic device. And you see it's a quad, quad chart and you have a general picture up a left and then you have, uh, you have the sponsors and the uh, down in the lower left, you have the purpose in the right, top right, and you have the funding in the bottom right. So this is what the students do. Uh, all of the students come up with one of these and they present them and then six or seven projects are chosen. We try to keep the number of students in a team down to five or less. Now, um, so on-site versus remote. On-site, students get up and mingle. You have evening socials and each of the quad saw, uh, charts is posted and students walk up to the easel to vote. Uh, something what, uh, is what uh, we do for voting for uh, lectures during the semester. You, you get three dots and you put your three dots and then 
Uh, then the instructors, that's us, we, we select six to eight projects. Sometimes we won't select a good project just because of the fact that it was done the previous year. Um, for the winning students, then projects walk up and they put their names on the project sheet, max of six, and they form teams. And then one of us, like myself, I'll be assigned to handle two to three teams. Um, tables are arranged so the team sit, sit together now. They're rearranged. And I walk from table to table to table for the teams that I'm uh, responsible for. And I help the students get started, tell them what's expected of them, and explain that they will be doing. And then in the evenings, we have pizza parties. They meet at their hotels. And we get together. And then they uh, plan their project. <clears throat> Remote. Uh, the students see the heads of the other students. Each of the quad charts is presented via remote mechanism, and then they use Microsoft Teams to vote. By the way, I found a problem with Microsoft Teams. You can vote more than three times. In fact, you can't block the number of times a person vote. Again, instructors pick the six to eight projects. Uh, you set up breakout rooms, the kind I showed you, and then the students enter a breakout room and I have to, and if the breakout room is full, meaning that it's full up, there's no room for another student, the students jump to another breakout room and pick another team. And um, the, I jump in, I'm in one of the mentors, so I'm assigned to three of the teams and I jump in and help the students. Um, and I can jump between breakout rooms. Um, in the evening, the students meet via the breakout rooms and they plan their project. And then they schedule when they're going to meet on a regular basis once the, uh, the week is over. Um, I've got to, let me hide this here. Finally, uh, after the first week, the entire class is remote. So you can see if I had my druthers, I would have done this whole class locally. The first week locally and the first week remotely, it's totally different. You can't do a remote beer party. Yeah, next. Okay. Um, Personal observations of remote teaching. Um, there's a lot more floundering getting started. It's, it's an issue of ordering books. Um, the books came in late, by the way, for the class. Um, mismatches in team assignments. Uh, bias, bias, remorse. People will students will pick a project and change, then find out it's not what they wanted. Whereas locally, could, they just could have walked up and asked the uh, person who was the sponsor for that project. Um, another problem I run into is that students will skip the recordings and just look at the posted PDF of the slides. Um, at least for me, I know I only do about 30% of the material on the slides and the rest is, uh, the rest is verbal. And if they, if they don't watch the lecture, they're going to miss a lot of that. On, on the positive side, they can run the, um, the, run the recording at two and three times speed. Uh, another problem you run into, and this would be local versus remote, you'd get the same thing, is students, some students don't participate as well as others. But, but we, can, we can account for that um, because, the, because what, at the end of the semester, um, the students grade each other. And that's part of their grade. And if they, if they haven't contributed equally, um, they basically get uh, graded down. Um, I have found personally that there's less retention of the material, a weaker understanding, remote versus local, and there's a greater tendency to do last minute uh, submissions. Um, so I think remote isn't gonna work for everybody. Um, it works for the more mature students who need less individual assistance. And if, for example, you're taking an advanced calculus course and it's your first time and you're not that good at math, this might not be the mechanism for you. Um, it, uh, problems with time management are exacerbated um, because you have family obligations, you have other things you have to do around the house, and there's a greater tendency to plagiarize material for assignments. Um, can't socialize. Bottom line from my perspective is a greater percentage of the students uh, could be left behind or pass without really retaining the material. Okay, so that's basically my talk. I, I think I went rather quickly. So now um, I can have questions. Uh, be a lot anybody... of discussion, Brian. <laughs> Excuse me? 
think I think there's going to be a lot of discussion on this. Uh, I'm I'm open for questions. Shoot. Um, should I leave the slides up? Or should I take them down? I'll leave the slides up. Okay, I'll leave them up. Take them down so we can so you can see our faces. <laughs> I I can see everybody. Um, right. So um, if anybody has any questions, so now, like I said, I have 13 years of teaching remotely and about uh, 10 to 15 years of teaching uh, locally. And, um, and I had one course where I had an opportunity to do something locally and then I did the same thing remotely. So I had a true AB comparison. I'm going to uh, okay. shoot one question to you, Brian, from the chat here. Tom Brown asks, uh, what do you attribute to poor retention on the part of remote students? Um, I think uh, it's two things. One, I think it's distraction. And uh, uh, second, I think is this loss of motivation. I think I don't think you can get quite as fired up when you can only see an instructor through as a talking head and you can't meet face to face and have conversations or meet over coffee. And so I, I think that um, uh, I know personally, it's a lot more difficult when you're um, when you're meeting uh, when you're meeting remotely. Uh, there's there's just uh, there tends to be a loss of interest and a loss of loss of drive after a while. Mm, That's my yeah. personal feeling. Yeah, uh, it, you won't see it with the top students, but you'll see it with the medium and uh, the lower level students. Okay. Okay, one more question was, uh, and this is from Carol Matthews. She asks, uh, great analysis, what are the opportunities for some proposed solutions? I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, the first uh, one of them, of course, is if they, uh, you want to have local teaching. Um, one possibility is to have remote local. That is, uh, you do what Princeton University does, and you have a lecture that everybody takes remotely. Then everybody go, gets in their car and goes to a local public school, and they meet with a TA or a faculty member, and they have interaction, and then they have their uh, they have the lect they have their uh, lecture. Oh, wow. uh, their, their now, that's one that's one solution. I can't talk to uh, K1 through 12. I can only talk at the university level. Yeah. yeah. Um, and other, another thing, of course, is if you're going to go remote, I think you're going to have to turn the internet into a utility. You're not going to be able to keep it the way it is because I feel so sorry for the, uh, for the underprivileged kids and the kids without a lot of money who can't get a high quality bandwidth. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, Rebecca points out. Well, you can you can unmute and read it yourself, Rebecca. Well, <laughs> maybe. She says uh, some of you may remember Jean Griffin, who spoke at one of our December coding day meetings. Uh, she created a their exercises called debugums. Basically, they're programs that have lots of mistakes in them. And the students work together in small teams to figure out what's wrong or missing. Also, this also works remotely, but the students are, are then working in teams. So he, she says, it right. sounds like your, your beer party style is a little like this. <laughs> what do you think? Right, right. Uh, would it yeah. But then again, that's, that's, yeah. Right, but then again, that's local, not remote. It's much harder to do something like that when you're looking at it, when you're just looking at heads. I mean, yeah. you can try, but it's much more difficult. Uh, maybe at at uh, public school level, uh, it might be a little easier. And I know the kids are going to say, "Covid be damned!" They're all going to go over to somebody's house and get together anyway. But um, mm -hmm. uh, I think anytime you can get people face to face, I think they, that motivation goes up, and interest goes up, and quality of learning goes up. That's just my personal feeling. And I don't care what they say, I, I, especially for the students in the middle and lower who are having difficulty understanding the material, they're really going to struggle with remote, or they are struggling with remote. I think we're going to have a whole year of lost students at uh, K-1 through 12. We're going to lose a whole year of education. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, there was actually, Brian, a, a very good uh, presentation back in April that I, I sat in on. It was a panel session that was run by the New Jersey uh, CSTA uh, groups, the uh, Computer Science uh, uh, Teachers Association. And this is mostly K through 12 uh, teachers, but we did have one um, uh, panelist was actually she's a, a Rutgers uh, professor, and so she was talking about about uh, university education, and it, a, a lot of the discussion was about you know remote education and some, you know how things actually work differently. And I I, I thought the the university speaker was particularly good because she said, look, we know we're not getting the same level of effectiveness of training and education right. in these in these courses that are being remote. So all we're trying to do is we're trying to focus on what's the minimum amount of stuff these people have to master and understand and comprehend so that they're actually able to take the next course without being totally lost. <laughs> so it's a, it's a little bit of what you're talking about. You know, instead of being a lost year, you say, well, it's a watered down year, but at least we're getting some, you know, we can get some some forward momentum with this. Yeah, well, there's just another problem I alluded to, um, and that is the recording of lectures and the replaying of those lectures. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, we, have, we have lectures in my courses, I have, I have lectures being given by people who are no longer in the school. And uh, good luck trying to get office hours with one of those people. Oh my God! <laughs> Who knows where they are? Who knows where they are? Um, and so, keep in mind that uh, you know you just get paid for the time you work. And um, if they go to multiple choice tests, that also dumbs down the quality of education because you, you're teaching. Your goal is to teach towards multiple choice tests, not not to teach towards uh, mastery of the material. Um, so, um, and I'm very much afraid that, uh, that's the direction the schools are going to go in because they're having number crunches. They're having big financial problems. And one way for them to, um, make money is to charge the same amount, but not have to worry about dormitories or, uh, uh, you know, the teaching assistants. They'll just pre-record all the lectures and do it that way and automate the examinations. Um, that's a scary thought and that could very well be the direction we're going in. Uh, well, so. All right. Um, this is Josephine. Yeah. Go ahead, Josephine. Thank you. Um, very interesting talk. Um, I have uh, found in my own experience and um, I've heard that some students actually do better in online uh, remote classes as compared with face-to-face -face classes. So I wanted to um, throw that in there. And I, I wondered if, uh, Brian, you could say a little bit about when you've had... Um, um, say a different at different ages in your classes, if um, you notice any patterns among the older students versus the the younger students. It's a very good question. Um, I wouldn't say older versus younger. I would I would put it at level of maturity. Um, so I would say um, that the more ma the more mature a student is, well, it's a combination of maturity and motivation. Uh, you know, students can be mature but disinterested. They can be uh, motivated but not mature. And I think the best combination is mature and motivated. Um, I also think that there are some types of students who are not very social. You know, talk about high end high end uh, autism. You know, and they might tend to do better online than uh, because they can't read read uh, body language anyway. So uh, for them, uh, remote teaching might be a benefit. 
as opposed to students who are uh, face to face, who are just normal and motivated. Um, so I don't, I don't know what the, I, I haven't seen any studies. I only know that uh, if I get a, a class of uh, graduate students, uh, they're all there because they want to be there. They're paying good money, and most of them do pretty well. Not always. We do get a couple of sliders. I get a, we get a couple who are late with their labs. They're they're late. Uh, they don't pull their weight, and they usually wind up getting uh, either low grades or dropping out. The school doesn't like to drop them because they want that fifty thousand dollars. You know, they really want that fifty thousand dollars, so they do their best not to drop them. It used to be, I remember when I was going to college, um, they liked they liked to drop students. They liked to flunk out in droves. A professor viewed the quality of his teaching by how bright he was and the number of students he could drop out, he could flunk out. That, that time has changed. They don't do that anymore because it's a money game. You flunk out your students, you basically lose all of your uh, income. So <laughs> that's probably a good thing, <laughs> but uh, but on the other hand, um, if they go remote, if they go remote uh, at both undergraduate, if they go remote at um, uh, well, the other thing is, how are you going to do the labs? How are you going to do chemistry and physics labs remotely? What what are you going to do? Tell tell every student to set up a chemistry lab in their basement? I, I don't know. Um, it's not. It's just not. It just doesn't compute. Um, and I do see a tendency to do online teaching, to do remote teaching, um, and the student that the universities view it as a real source of money to do online teaching, uh, remote rather, not online, remote teaching. They view it as, a, as an untapped resource uh, for revenue, and I see a lot more universities getting into the game late. And a lot of them are not equipped for what they're doing. And I do feel sorry for those students where they don't set it up properly. Um, the students are going to get cheated. They'll, they'll get their degree, but they won't get the education uh, at the graduate level anyway. Undergraduate, I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't see, I don't. Do you, do you, yeah. I have another question just quickly, um, but I don't want to take up too much time here. Um, do you think that your lecture style has changed at all as a result of teaching remotely and if so could you say a little bit about that absolutely uh primarily uh primarily because i cannot see the student's reaction i cannot see body language mm -hmm. i cannot tell if they're puzzled Many of the students, for example, will not turn on their uh, video. They'll only turn on the audio. So I have a very difficult time uh, determining whether or not I've left them behind or whether the students are up in the class. It's very hard to do. And I think I did a lot better job when it was face to face because I could call on, if I could see that there was a problem with the class, I'd call on one student and I'd ask them a very easy question and then that would be a lead-in and I'd do a review of the material and I'd keep going over and over again until I got everybody or at least most everybody I can't do that here I really can't um, I can't tell us I can't tell if the students are bored half the time they turn off their uh, their cameras I can't see what's going on um, they don't um, I've got and uh, the one thing I one metric I have is um, I uh, have a lot of recorded lectures, and then we have quizzes based on those lectures. And I can tell that about a third to half the students are not watching the video. They're only looking at the PDF of the slides because a lot of the material is, is in the lectures and it's not on the slides. And so I can tell that about a third to half of the students are not watching the lectures. They're just looking at the slides. I can understand why, you know, they've got regular jobs during the day and they're trying to do a master's at night and it's not easy, but uh, they're shortchanging themselves and it'll show up in their grades. Yeah, one of this. Uh, Ray, I have, I have uh, some comments. Uh, one of the problems that I've had with remote teaching of industrially sponsored students is that they get preempted by work deadlines 
in their regular jobs and the managers are not always understanding uh, about the demands made on them by uh, regular coursework which goes on a, a regular academic schedule so one has to work around the students with that uh, and um, the other the other point I the other point I had was that I was I was plunged into everybody was plunged into remote teaching by COVID and for, suddenly all these industrial students were at home and they'd been watching videos and I gave them the option of picking one night of the week when they would get together as a class because suddenly they were all disconnected from each other and that worked out very well. Right. They actually yeah. liked it. Uh, um, I would go through the material quite quickly. I gave, I recorded the class so they could watch it later in their own time if they had family obligations that evening or whatever. But they liked it because I would go through the material fairly quickly and then I would convene a discussion group in which they would tell me on their, what was on their minds and in which I would tell more stories. And that, that worked. Now, I have, I, have, I, have, I have similar but different problems. Um, in my class uh, right now, I mean, I, I could talk about elsewhere, but right now, all my students are in a master's program, professional master's program, and they're all sponsored. And the sponsors are their employers. And yes. the sponsors are paying about $50,000 for them to be there, thirty dollars to $50,000 for them to be there. So uh, they are very understanding for that reason. But we also give a little because sometimes the, we have students who are in the military and they have to go out on deployment. So we have to make uh, adjustments for that. Um, that having been said, I think the fact that they do not do face-to-face, -face, they do not see each other, uh, they cannot get together, um, I think that's a real issue, um, especially in team, team uh, projects. We do have cl classes, excuse me, we have classes which are 100% individual, there are no teams. Uh, there it doesn't matter so much. Um, there, there is no back and forth between team members but, in, but I would say the first two classes are all team, and then we have a bunch of individual individual classes where they all get their own grade. There's no, there's no getting together and doing team assignments. Um, but, but one of the problems we have is that the material I teach is team-based. Uh, the reason being that systems engineering essentially is the world of engineering of teams. And they have to learn to interact. They have to learn to manage teams because it's part of their core curricula. Um, that we do have the pure academic material, um, but then we have the other side, which is engineering management. And so we try to make them all function as team managers over time. And uh, they, they struggle with it. Some of them do better than others. But we don't want them going out with a degree from Georgia Tech, a graduate degree from Georgia Tech, and then they crash and burn in, uh, at their company. We don't want that. We want them to succeed. So it's a mix of uh, team and individual. And I, I, uh, the other thing, I do think, though, that even with all that, the fact that a student can't walk into my office and ask me a question and I can't sit down with a pencil and paper and show them something, I, I think that's a problem for me because I can't see their body language and I can't tell if I'm losing them. Yeah, I, uh, and I, many, I can manage that with office hours. I, uh, when I was teaching in Ho this, this remote class in Hobo, in my office in Hoboken, I actually trained the camera on myself and the blackboard and I could see them. And that worked pretty well. The other thing is that this company was widely scattered, so they were used to working in geographically dispersed teams anyway. But that I would okay, say so they had prior, rather than the right, board. so they had prior experience doing it, right? Yes. In my case, it's their, it's their first experience. Mm -hmm. And we're normally, uh, it's a hybrid program, and normally the first week is spent on campus just for that reason. Right. Um, do it that so we do, yeah, some, Tom Brown says that uh, they found the breakouts helpful. We do have breakout rooms. Remember, they have teams, and the teams all use breakout rooms, which are dedicated to the specific teams you saw they had names on them they were those breakout rooms were specifically for those teams 
and we do have, have that. But it's still not the same thing as everybody getting together at somebody's house, you know. But then again, on the positive side, we have people all over the world in our courses. I've had people from Central America, Europe, Asia, all being at home and taking this course. So that's something that you cannot do with local. You can only do that with remote teaching. So, uh, Brian, I have a question. Um, so maybe Another question. So sure. along the lines of what Andre was saying, have you considered or is there a possibility of having virtual office hours where you meet one-on-one -on -one with students? Maybe they make an appointment to see you virtually where you could have, I mean, I have, um, I have a, a device I bought to teach math where I could, it's like a, it's like a whiteboard. So I guess what I'm thinking is maybe you can't see them face to face, but with a little, um, I don't know, a little creativity maybe, would it be possible for you to simulate an office hour where they could stop in and talk to you one on one? Well, first thing you have to remember is I do have office hours. I have office hours every Wednesday from 4.30 to 6. And uh, anybody who wants to can drop in. Um, and then in addition to that, um, I have follow-up through email. And if that's not enough, uh, I can schedule a personal meeting with the student. What, uh, what so we do that. do you use for that, oh, the, your office hours? Blue jeans. Thank you. Uh, but keep, but keep in, I don't know how many students you have in, in your class. I have 40. So um, it might not be practical to do it the way you suggested. I don't know. Well, you have office hours so, and you have an electronic platform that supports that. So, I mean, do students take advantage of that? Yes, they do. We also have a discussion board which I, I showed you a picture of, where the students can ask a question and then other students can answer the question or I can answer the question. Um, or one of the other instructors can jump in and answer the question. Um, there's one, two, three, four instructors in the course. And so far I've been the only one answering the questions in the discussion board. Everybody else is lazy. I'm the only one who jumps in and answers the questions. I guess that's because I'm retired and the other instructors all have other full-time jobs. <laughs> so I'm the, I'm the only one with the luxury of time to go in and answer the student questions. Thank you. But that was a good question, Josephine. And the answer is we would if we could. Yeah. Uh, but it's very hard yeah, to do. I only have yeah. nine students in my remote class. And in the class... How wonderful. In the class that was forced to be remote, I had 13, of whom 12 were Chinese. <laughs> Try doing that with 40, Andre. <laughs> <laughs> I did have to do that once last winter. We, the class was canceled by a snowstorm, and I just emailed the <laughs> class, said, get on Zoom at the usual time instead yeah. of coming. To what, what do you I do said. if, if uh, several students show up at the same time? Well, it's expected. They They just... Uh, they do what we're doing here. We all take turns. Uh, one person will speak and say, I have some questions. And then everybody else will wait. And then uh, the next person will ask questions. And the next person will ask. Think, think of it as after giving a lecture, people walk up and they're all standing in a line right. waiting to talk to you. Think right. of it and, like that. And if a student Very needed similar, a private... Like that. Uh, yeah. Conversation, would there be a possibility for that also? Or private assistance, would there be a possibility for that? And if so, how would that happen? Yeah, we have when they go to the discussion board and ask a question. But if they're shy or they're, they, they don't yeah. want to make an idiot of themselves, they feel then, because if they could do that, other students will help answer the question too. Uh, that's level one. Level two is they shoot me an email with the question and I answer the question. That's level two. Huh. And level three is they say we don't get it and I schedule it. I schedule a private online huh. session with them. 
Thank you. But it's hard to do that with 40 students. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not, and I'm not. Uh, I'm not proposing that. But I'm. I'm just asking about. You know, thinking about different ways that students might require support and what structures might be in place. Well, the use of teams is very helpful because Shabba. they help. Each, that's one thing. The discussion boards are good too, uh, because they can ask a question on board. the discussion, and other students can answer the question without me having to jump Correct. in and answer. So that's helpful too. Sure. Um, they also, the teams, we, we, we don't leave them as individuals. As you know, we, we put them in teams of four to five students for, uh, uh, they uh, move along they, with those teammates and over time they get to know each other. You know, we have had situations where two of the students are in the same company and then for them, it's just like local. You know, they're they're physically adjacent to each other, maybe sitting at the next desk. We have had that, but not too often. Thank you. Okay. I think we're going to uh, call it quits here. Thanks, everybody, for coming. I see Bob, Thank you, you, uh, Bob Krovitz, there. you've uh, added in. Good to see you there. Yeah, Brian, I am going I'm, to I'm gonna try to make the uh, uh, recording of this presentation available. So, uh, you know, watch your email for that. I think um, we had some interesting discussion. All right. Next meeting is going to be October 15th, also a Thursday night, and that's our computer graphics talk. So we'll see you all there. Terrific.